Some years after the Civil War was over, Confederate General Robert E. Lee went to visit a friend's plantation in Kentucky. And out in front of the mansion were the sad remains of a grand old magnolia tree whose limbs had been blown away by the artillery of the Union Army. And despite the passage of years, the lady of the house was still bitter. And with angry tears, she showed Lee the scarred and the blackened tree trunk. Then she paused, waiting expectantly for him to denounce the hated Yankees. The general was silent for a while, and then looking at the tree, he said, cut it down, dear lady, and forget it. For years, the woman had been poisoning and shrinking her life by clinging to bitter memories. And as far as Lee was concerned, it was long past time to stop and let go. Stopping, however, would take a profound change of heart because it's with our heart that that you and I see the world and we measure what is important and we decide how to respond to it. If our hearts are mean, bitter, small, they'll project their own narrow, ugly image on the world. We'll find in the world exactly what we expect to find. Nothing good. Those who might be friends will shrink into enemies. Situations that might well be opportunities, we will view as problems. And in the process, our hearts themselves will shrink smaller and narrower with less and less room to take in the friendship and love people want to give us. But what if our hearts aren't cold, hard, and small? What if instead our hearts are warm and open and hopeful? What will we see in the world then? It'll be a very different world, a world filled with people of value, with whom God isn't done with yet. A world of people who are struggling to get life right, People who will no doubt get it right more often if we lend them a hand instead of turning away in rejection. Large hearts can see that. They can turn enemies into friends. They can love people towards wholeness just the way God does. Several weeks ago, we looked at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Today, we take a look at his Sermon on the Plain, which hits many of the same themes and calls for large hearts. Listen for God's word to us from Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 27. Jesus says, But I say to you that listen... I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. 
for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you give back. This is the word of the Lord. Huston Smith, the great scholar of world religions, has written that Christianity shares many affirmations with several of the world's great religions. Uh, Love your neighbor. That's a thought found in many of the world's faiths. Help those in need. Yes, again. Obey God. Certainly. But when it comes to Jesus' command to love your enemies, that's an injunction found solely in the religion of Jesus, said Smith. One of the reasons that we come to church on Sunday is to refresh our surprise at encountering the God who has met us in this Jesus, the Christ. Nine out of ten Americans say they believe in God, but what God. We think we have an inkling of who God is, but when we hear Jesus Christ, God's Son, God with us, saying things like he says in this Sunday's Gospel, our reaction just might be, gee whiz, I guess I didn't know God as well as I first thought. One of the challenges we Christians in the United States have is that we lapse into the notion that being a Christian is roughly synonymous with being a thinking, caring, sensitive American. Too often we fail to see any difference between America and God's kingdom. Churches where we come on a more or less regular basis to bring out our better nature, to trot out our best moral inclinations, except, of course, when we come to church and actually allow ourselves to listen to Jesus. Even the most complacent listener knows, after listening to Jesus' Sermon on the Plain, that we have come to a head-on collision with a worldview that is not in line with most what most Americans believe, let alone what most Americans practice. Here is an invitation to a way of living that really doesn't come naturally. Every Sunday, we want God to come to us. We even pray, thy kingdom come. But when God's kingdom became present in Jesus, and when Jesus says what he did in this sermon, again, we find ourselves wondering if we really want God as much as we first thought. But I say to you who are willing to hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other as well. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks and don't demand your things back from those who take them. Really? (laughs) Is Jesus serious here or is this just hyperbole? There's no way you and I could do that. We're human. And the human thing is to plot against enemies or at least to do everything we can to avoid or contain them, to retaliate when we've been struck, to be careful about whom we loan money. What's going on here? Well, the first thing is that this sermon is not 
first of all, a list of rules and duties for us. Rather, it is a picture of the sort of God who comes to us in Jesus. We're not being handed a new impossible rule book of do's and don'ts. We're being given a sketch, a vision of God. This is a sermon that is pointing to who God is and what God is up to in the world. And in effect, Jesus is saying to us that when it comes to disagreeable people, persons we might consider to be actively against us, we shouldn't retaliate tit for tat when we've been offended and assaulted. Because exercising restraint and mercy is the way God has responded to our own behavior. Apparently, when it comes to living our lives, to deciding how we ought to treat other people, and how we ought to respond to the injustices that are often inflicted upon us, it makes a great deal of difference to know the sort of God we have. Not the one we want, but the sort of God we have one who loves enemies. Love your enemies. Do good towards those who hate you. This is the world, this is the kingdom God is building. Tremendous words, tremendous vision, (laughs) but how do you live it? How can we love people who have hurt us? How do we do good to people who have gossiped about us or cheated us or otherwise oppressed us or done worse? How do we love a parent who has abused us or the teacher who said we would never be able to learn or the ex-wife or ex-husband who's tried to destroy the relationship we have with our children? How can we love our enemies when everything we feel inside us about them makes us want to do unto them as they have done unto us? How can I love someone I feel no love for? How can I bless those who curse me, Pastor Gail? The answer to that is indicated by Scripture and by the life of Jesus. And it is that you can love those you feel no love for only when you decide to do so. Love, you see, is not a feeling. It's a choice. Love is the decision to do right even when wrong to do good even when mistreated, to bless even when you have been bad-mouthed, to forgive when you have been hurt, to care even when you have been dismissed. Love is not what we feel. It is the good that we decide to do, and then do. How do we love our enemies when we do not feel like loving them? How do we get up in the morning to work when we feel tired? How do we diet when we feel like having a giant bowl of ice cream with chocolate sauce and nuts? We simply decide. We make a choice. And we follow through. Jesus here tells us a little bit of what it means to love your enemy, of what we must decide to do if we are to love him or her, or in fact, anyone, whether they are an enemy or our friend. He tells us that we are to bless rather than to curse, to wish the best for others rather than the worst. He tells us to be merciful as God is merciful and as we have received 
God's mercy. To forgive as we have been forgiven, without exception or hope of reward, but simply because that is God's way with us. And of course, we have heard in today's gospel reading, Jesus tells us, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And there is really no greater piece of advice about how we are to love others. When Martin Luther King's home was burned down one night because there were those who didn't like his message, one of the things he told the crowd gathered bent on meeting violence with violence was this. When you live by the rule an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you end up with a nation of blind and toothless people. Dr. King knew with all his large heart that a new society could not be built by violent means. He believed that the only way one could defeat one's enemies was with love. This sermon of Jesus, the Sermon on the Plain, isn't addressed to some select inner circle of folks. But as it states at the very first verse there, to you who are willing to hear. To choose to love in the face of enmity, to do good in the face of hurt and harm is not easy. It's difficult. It's demanding. And it is humbling. It is why we call ourselves practicing Christians. The great theologian Karl Barth reminds us that the Christian congregation consists only of beginners. One never becomes so adept at the practice of the Christian faith that one becomes an expert at following Jesus. He writes this, one never is a Christian. One can only become one again and again. In the evening of each day, somewhat ashamed about one's Christianity of the day just over. And in the morning of each new day, glad that one may dare to be one all over again. Doing so with solace, with one's fellow human beings, with hope and grace. The Christian congregation is of one mind that it consists only of beginners. Well, fellow beginners, we are all at the start of a new week. Let us begin again, choosing to live our lives by a gospel deeper than hatred, stronger than revenge, a gospel for those with larger hearts. Thanks be to God for his incredible gift to us in this teaching from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.